Thanks for tuning in, everybody. I have with me Lisbeth Bickett today. Um, can't wait for her to share everything with you about compassionate communication. Um, Lisbeth, do you mind just introducing yourself a little bit? Sure, yeah. Um, I'm Lisbeth Bickett, and I'm in California, in Northern California, near Lake Tahoe. Um, right now, I do mostly communication coaching. My background is as a life coach, and I work with nonviolent communication or compassionate communication. And I'm also working on my master's for restorative practices, which is a social science, which is all about building relationships to create strong communities and um, strong uh, behavior, positive behavior in civil societies. And can I just ask about that? Um, does this also involve working in like our penal system in any way? It, yeah, definitely it can. Um, one term that more people are familiar with is restorative justice. Mm -hmm. And it is, uh, it, there are many systems, like in my state, Oakland, California has a restorative justice program and willing um, offenders and victims, if they choose, can, can enter a restorative justice process. One of the really awesome things about it is it's victim centered mm -hmm. and our justice system actually doesn't really address the harm that's caused by a victim and restorative justice does. It's all about repairing the harm that's done and giving the offender a chance to actually repair the harm. Mm -hmm. So the victim and the offender uh, work together to to repair the harm that was done. That's so necessary. Yeah. <laughs> and one reason I'm really excited to talk with you today is because, you know, the reality of this life is we're, we all do things to offend against one another and sometimes very seriously. And so as parents, we are raising children in a world where there, there are evil realities that things that are very, very harmful and, and sad and permanently damaging um, occur. And so having the skill set that you've been working on and that I've been blessed to work with you a little bit in getting some coaching and nonviolent communication, um, I think is so transformative. I wish that I like, could have learned this myself in my home growing up um, to navigate conflict and um, I don't know, to have that hope that you can have restoration when it comes to little small offenses and also like in the big scheme of things with processing larger evil things that are occurring. Um, and I, I do want to mention to my audience briefly, like I know you and I have some differences in our worldview, which is one of the awesome reasons I wanted to bring you on here um, because you can model very well, like how to communicate with anybody about anything and truly connect with them and respect their human dignity. Um, okay, so thanks for letting me go on about why I'm so excited. <laughs> um, in the home setting with parents, okay, there's so many things we, we deal with with our children. And um, I guess what we need to start with, with compassionate communication in the home, is really an overview from you about what that whole approach is and where it came from. Sure, yeah. So um, nonviolent communication is the term most recognized. And um, nonviolent communication was a form of communication that was developed by a man named Marshall Rosenberg. He passed away about a year and a half ago. But um, he traveled the world and using this kind of communication actually was quite involved in many high, um, high, high conflict negotiations and conversations. He spent a lot of time actually working with Israel and Palestine and, and with the government and, and trying to help facilitate conversations. He worked a lot with gangs and trying to diminish gang violence and uh, facilitating conversations between rivaling gangs. So 
this is something that's been used for, um, I think that he started working maybe in the 70s. I'm actually not sure uh, exactly, but sometime around there. And it's been around for a while. It's, it's really growing in recognition and, and use. And um, it, it's had powerful impacts, continues to. And really, I think, given the, um, the climate of our country right now, and um, it's really important skill to be developing is how just what you said how to talk to to people of all different beliefs and recognizing that we all share more than we are different and, and so much we all have the same basic needs the need for safety for our loved ones to be safe and healthy and the need to be able to express ourselves freely, the needs to be able to make choice, make our own choices, the you know, need for autonomy, um, the need for intimacy and connection with other people and, and with our environment, and, um, and a need for meaning and purpose. And we all have that, and everything that we do all every action that we take is simply an attempt to get one of those needs met and it's i find it so powerful to recognize that to be able to look at anything that anybody is doing and know that they're actually just trying to get a need met that i understand and share i may not understand their strategy which is you know the actual action that they're doing it may not make any sense to me when i first look at it but if I can stay open hearted and curious, I have an opportunity to learn about what it is that I share with them and what it is, what is, what's that need underneath that action that I actually understand and that I want them to get met. I want every person on this planet to be, ha be healthy and, and to have meaning and purpose and to make their own, be able to choose for themselves and, and, to be able to have loving, intimate connections. And so you, you just, when you go to that, there's, there's no discourse because I think most of us, we want that and we want that for each other. So, um, so this is what, what nonviolent communication is, is about and compassionate communication is the idea that we all share basic needs and that all of our actions are just attempts to get those needs met. And the way that we communicate is we use words to communicate to each other and to listen to each other for the feelings and the needs in, in the communication. What is it that that person is feeling? And what needs are lying underneath that feeling? So if somebody is feeling um, if if I, I'm, I'm witnessing a scary behavior, maybe somebody's yelling, or maybe they're throwing their fists, or maybe they're running away, but what they're doing, there's probably some fear underneath there. There's probably some, some uncertainty, some confusion, um, and underneath those feelings, maybe those needs for safety that I understand for for connection and for understanding to be known. So that's a place where I can really connect and understand somebody, no matter what their beliefs are, that, you know, that they still share those same, those same needs and I can understand that. So it really enables a conversation that is very connected and compassionate. And, um, and, and that's what it's really all about is, is just creating connections that are empowering, compassionate, giving and receiving between people. Yeah. And when I interact with you outside of our interview, of course, even still in the interview, but I can really, like, that skill that you've honed in connecting and being compassionate, 
I just feel so disarmed. You know, like I can talk to you about anything and I feel very loved and very supported and it's very easeful and I love that. And I want to be that kind of a mother and person. And I hope that our audience can also um, take advantage of some of the tips you're going to share and some of the resources that we'll be linking. And maybe if they would like, they could reach out and work with you. Um, before we move on a little more specifically into like how to break down compassionate communication and utilizing it in the family setting. Um, I know like the theme of this series is involving like our quest for what is good and true and beautiful. And so for people like myself and many of us, there's a religious component and that can be very divisive and it's, it's scary because we, like you said, we all have this need. We want connection and intimacy and acceptance and, and to feel loved and safe. Um, and I think it's really good that as adults, we start practicing these types of skills to model for our children. Like you can engage anybody lovingly the way that Christ did. You know, he was disarming in many ways. He had this penetrating gaze where he saw clearly into people and he spoke to them anyway. And he spoke love, you know. Um, and I feel like compassion communication gives us a lot of practical tools for that. So I want to ask... Um, for those of us who were, you know, maybe grasping towards figuring out religious truths and um, how to navigate, you know, that element of our lives and our family life and raising children with some sort of religion, um, do you have any thoughts or tips in using this technique for communicating with other people who maybe um, find it offensive or in the midst of our fear of speaking about our faith, like to our family or other people we work with and that sort of thing? So you're talking about wanting to be able to, um, to, to, to fully express your connection to, to God, to your religion, and to the beliefs, to be able to show up and fully express those to people who maybe don't share those beliefs without, and staying connected with them, to, to be able to do that, and at the same time, uh, and not put them on the defense. Is that what you're asking about? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there's always the question, if you, if you notice somebody disconnecting, if you notice some, if, if, you know, there's so many things that we might notice, um, body language or words or you just kind of see somebody getting agitated um so if you notice something like that happening just going right into it with love and compassion and courage you know when you when you were just talking about about jesus one of the messages that i remember when um you know when i used to i really study that was that Jesus was was not always nice. I mean, he didn't always. There were times where he he had he had real strength and urgency in his words, and he what he did was speak the truth. And I think that he really um, exemplified not being afraid of showing up and just fully alive and and calling out. I don't mean in a bad way, at really speaking what he was seeing was alive in the situation and in others. And having that confidence that he had so much love and exception, or, or, um, acceptance and compassion that he could hold that space for people to look at their own discomfort. And he challenged people to look at their discomfort, right? And, their, and the areas in their life where they weren't maybe in alignment, where there was, you know, some dissonance. And so if we are talking to somebody and we see, you know, we notice something, whatever it is, just to, and we start feeling in ourselves, like we kind of see them twitching or looking the other way. And then in our own bodies, we start to notice a little anxiety. So really kind of like, ooh, I'm, starting to feel worried that I'm turning them off or that they're, you know, so noticing that in ourselves and then just saying it, you know, I noticed that you're kind of moving around. I'm wondering what you're feeling right now when I'm talking about this, 
I wonder what it's like for you when you hear me say that. When you hear me reference, you know, Jesus, or, or when you heard me just say that, I'm wondering what it was like for you when you heard that. And, or you can guess, um, I'm noticing this, you're doing this, I'm wondering if you're feeling uncomfortable. And you just, just have the conversation rather than try and brush over it. And in a really loving and compassionate way, like, I really care. I really care what's going on. And I'm sharing this because I want to be connected to you and understand you. Would you tell me? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, I think that's how I would handle it. <laughs> that's great. Thank you. And, you know, full disclosure, my fiance and I have worked with you as, um, communication and preparation and discernment and that sort of thing um, before we make our decision to move forward with marriage and um, it has it has kept us together because we both come from broken backgrounds and we have lots of triggers and a lot of nasty little patterns and habits of reacting to each other um, but what I found through working with you is that I'm learning more about myself mm. and what I really need. Mm. And I'm learning how to be humble and to express that and make myself vulnerable. And I think that's extremely hard for a lot of us, um, but it is so worth it. And as you and I have talked before, we really think it's very much at the heart of the gospel in the first place. <laughs> is that true? Yeah connection, you know, and love and, and vulnerability and humility um, and being honest about the good, the bad, and the ugly. So um, thank you. And yeah. Um, yeah, it is so true. And, and, and that's really where it starts. It always starts with the self. It always starts with, oh, I just noticed that I'm starting to feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. and, and because I noticed something. And that's always a good place to start too, is, you know, I just said this thing and I'm kind of scared. I'm kind of, I'm worried now about what I just said. Mm -hmm. And just, it's that, that truth and vulnerability. And it always starts within the self. And so often, like you're just talking about the conversations when you're learning specific tools, the practice happens in inside. The practice happens with the self. And the most important and powerful and potentially harmful conversations we have are not with other people. They're the conversations we have with ourselves. And it's really hard to be compassionate for somebody else and to connect really deeply with somebody else if we're not being compassionate with ourselves. If we just, we judge other people because we're so judgmental of ourselves. And um, so it really, it all starts with the self and the conversations you can have with that, your higher being, God, Jesus, whatever that is. But that, I think that that is one of those needs that we have is to be connected with something greater than ourselves. And the conversations we have within that connection are so important and so powerful. Yeah, what a great point. It is so true. <laughs> I have learned how to be more compassionate in my inner dialogue. Yeah. Um, and also, as you mentioned, you know, feeling free to have that honesty and vulnerability and connection in prayer with God, if you do believe. Um, yeah. it's, it takes time to develop that if, if you haven't, you know, grown up with it or whatever, or even still, you know, just as life moves on, sometimes it's hard. Um, would you mind just breaking down some of those basic steps um, that people learn when they first learn nonviolent communication. Um, and maybe we could do a little role playing of some kind in a family scenario to help people grasp, you know, how they could start practicing that. Yeah, definitely. So there are specific steps and tools, like you said, when learning and using compassionate communication. And before I go into them, just really quickly, I want to share and just kind of remind that they are tools. And just like a hammer and a nail, those are tools to build a house, but they're not the house. And so we, we use these tools to practice the being that we want to be. They help us, in, they help us experience what it's like 
to be compassionate. And ultimately the goal is to just embody compassion and to not have to kind of go consciously into the tools, but they're really helpful to get it started. So sometimes people get stuck on, oh, I need to do this and this and this, and they kind of forget great is just compassion and connection. So, um, so the tools are involve four steps of language which connects versus language which disconnects. So there's four components. And we always start with observations. Being able to make totally non-judgmental observations of what it is that we have experienced or we are experiencing. And this is just a huge, huge component that seems really simple at first, but once people start to actually practice it, they, they actually see how, how big it is and how, how, how much judgment actually is everywhere in their thoughts mm -hmm. and, in, and in their life. So in that first step, we want to pull our judgments and our criticisms and our evaluations and all of our stories, all of the, the stories that we've created our whole life, pull them out of what we're experiencing so that we can really look objectively at a situation. And so an example would be um, that we walk into a room and we see stuff everywhere. And in our head, we think, wow, what a mess. This place is a mess and nobody cares about it except for me and I'm all alone here. <laughs> and so if we can pull the story out of that, the observation is very specific. There's some clothes on the couch, some shoes in the middle of the floor, somebody's book bag over, you know, in the corner over there and dishes in the sink. So that's the, that's the observation. That's, there's no judgment. If I were to take a picture of the room, that's what I would see. And so right away, when we are able to pull those observations out, we kind of diffuse the situation a little bit, you know, cause we look at what's really going on. And if we're, going to have a conversation with somebody we've right around right away pulled out so much of our language that is going to put them on the defense so if i walk in the room and my you know roommate whoever that is a child a partner an actual just somebody sharing the house if i walk in there and i say oh my god this house is such a mess this is horrible they're immediately going to feel just defensive they might run, they might fight. It's gonna put them in that fight, flight, freeze mode. And, but if I walk in there and I say, oh, you know, I, I see that there's some shoes on the floor and there's this, the clothes on the couch, you know, I haven't really given an opinion at that point. So it's, it's just really objective. There's kind of nothing much going on with that. So that's where we start. Then the next piece is to identify the feelings that the experience brings up. So the feelings that are alive in us in that situation and to be able to separate those feelings for the, from thoughts. Thoughts can be very disconnecting. Feelings are a level that we can all connect with each other. You experience sadness, I experience sadness. You, you know what fear feels like, I know what fear feels like. I'm not gonna, who am I to tell you you're not sad or you're not afraid? But if, but if I give you a thought, like, you don't care about me, well, I can, I'm going to argue with that versus i am just told you I'm feeling really sad or you told me you're feeling really sad. I'm not going to argue with that because you're not saying anything about me. Mm -hmm. So going back to that same example, I walk into the room and I just internally starting before I even have a conversation, oh, I going to pull my story out. Oh, I see there's clothes and there's, there's shoes and there's dishes. What am I feeling? What's alive in me right now? Frustration, anger, fatigue, tired, overwhelmed, maybe hopeless. You know, what are the actual feelings? So that's the second component. The third component is to separate 
what I'm needing from the strategies that I might think will meet those needs. So I may not be able to get agreement with you about a strategy, you know, you picking up the clothes or you taking out the garbage, but I can probably get agreement with you about a need that I have and that you can understand. Like, you know, I have a need, I have a need for rest and relaxation. Well, you're not going to argue with me. Like, yeah, we all have that need, right? So again, I walk in and I see the house and I see the shoes and the clothes and the dishes. I'm, I recognize I'm feeling frustrated and hopeless and I spend a little more time and I think, oh, and I'm really feeling exhausted and overwhelmed and actually really sad. And so what, what are those feelings? What, what's underneath those? What are the needs? Well, the needs are for rest and relaxation and some and peace and you know maybe I've had a really hard day and um, and a need to um, know that there's some like a shared reality between me and everybody else in the house that we've come to some agreements and those agreements are being honored that there's a need for order like I can't just sit down and relax while I see all this stuff around so now you know I've identified my needs and now I can go to myself or the other person with, and I can say something that is going to hopefully connect us, but it's definitely gonna be less likely to bring up defensive, a you know, defensive response. So, so that's the fourth component is a request. And versus making a demand, rather than telling somebody what to do, I'm going to engage them, I'm gonna ask them for help. So, I may want to make the request of myself, the request, you know, what am I willing to do here? Do I want to have a conversation with this other person? Do I want to ask them to, for support? You know, let me think about that. And if I decide I do, now I can go to them and really connect, let them hear who I am and what's alive in myself and keep it all about me and give them the opportunity to show up and to support me. So now instead of walking into the room and, and saying, oh my God, what a mess. You guys don't care about me or anything. And every time I come home, I see this and I, I just can't stand that. Clean it up right now or else you're gonna, you know, I'm not making you dinner, right? Well, that's just, they're gonna get mad. <laughs> right. Even if they do it, there's gonna be a lot of slamming and throwing and stomping, you know, especially if they're kids. And um, so instead I can walk in and I can look around and, you know, take a moment because I've had to process this, and then I can I can say, Hey, I see there's some shoes on the floor and there's dishes in the sink, and you know, notice just making some of the observations. I'm feeling exhausted and, and just really overwhelmed and, and just and kind of sad because I need some, I need to rest. I need some rest. I need some order in order to be able to rest. And I really need help. And I don't know how, I don't know, I don't know how to do this. Would you be willing to help me get the rest and, and be able to just kind of get some relaxation right now? Would you be able to help me do that? And, you know, get some, some agreement there. Yes, I would be. No, I maybe. No, I wouldn't be. Um, and if they, but that if there is an agreement, yes, I would be, then we can ask, well, what are you willing to do? Would you be willing to put your clothes away? Would you be willing to pick up your shoes? Would you be willing to do the dishes? What are you willing to do? And really making those requests. And then the, the, the very last piece of it is to recognize that when we make a request, it has to be a request. It can't be a demand. And so if I say, would you be willing to pick up your shoes? And the person, other person says no, and I get pissed off and stomp or yell or 
go silent and you know stomp off any of those things i didn't make a request i made a demand because a request a request comes with that recognition that you can say no and i'm not going to I'm not going to punish you for saying no. If we punish somebody for saying no, then no matter what words we used, we made a demand. So in order to, um, in order to be able, in order to hear when somebody says no, says no and respect that, it's helpful to go inside and recognize, remember that we all have needs we share. So I have, I had a need for rest and relaxation. If, if the other person that I made a request to said no, they have a need that they're saying yes to and to recognize there's something that they need. And so I can ask them, if I have the energy, I can ask them, I'm curious, when you said no, I know that you love me and support me. I know these things. So I'm wondering what it is that you're needing right now. What, just, you know, would you be willing to tell me about that? And, um, and so what we have is a conversation that's going on here where we're each trying, we're showing up for each other rather than, and we may not get that need for the house to be clean in that moment, but when we remember that picking the shoes up is a strategy and the need is to rest and to have peace, we, may, we can work on either on ourselves or with the other person on getting another way that to get that need met maybe a way to get that need met is okay well then you know what i'm going to do because i need to do that is i'm actually going to go out to eat and i'll come back after i've had an hour to myself or i'm going to go take a bath and i'll see you in an hour and a half whatever i'm going to get that need met in another way since i can't get it met you know here in the house so one, I, I love this. This is just such a typical everyday experience. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of people, particularly the men I can think of, are like, well, you know, they're my kids. This is my house. Why should I bother asking them what they need? They should just listen to me. They should just do it. And, you know, um, so I guess I have two questions. One is, how do you diffuse yourself? Like, what can you do when you're like, okay, I want to try to use nonviolent communication <laughs> um, to reset so you can enter into that dialogue? And then my second question would be maybe fleshing out a little bit more, like what, what would be some of the needs a child might be having um, to help us feel more compassionate in that situation and more willing to have these conversations in those messy, heated moments? Yeah, definitely. Really good questions. And it's going to be really hard to show up for somebody else in a compassionate way before, until you've had, you've given yourself compassion and empathy. Empathy, basically being aware of and totally present with what it is that you're experiencing without any kind of judgment. So, it starts actually with that practice, that self-practice that you and I talked about. It starts with learning the skills and not even trying to use them when we you know, walk into the house and kind of just do our thing. But it starts by taking time at another time of the day, at the end of the day or the beginning of the day to reflect on experiences that we've had and give ourselves some compassion and some empathy. Oh, I remember, you know, at nighttime going to bed. Oh, I remember when I came home, this thing happened. And, you know, maybe journaling or just processing in our own mind and heart. What was I thinking? What was I feeling then? What, at, what was the observation? What actually happened? And then wh what did it, how did I feel? And what was I needing? what what's a request i would have liked to have made what what would have been helpful for me at that moment so that's the first place is just you have to practice on your own and then finding another person to practice with hey you know i want to practice this thing this conversation i'm going to have or this conversation i had can we can we 
role play it together and getting that practice. So it's, you really, you kind of just, you, you wouldn't, yeah, I, I live up in Tahoe where there's a lot of snow and I wouldn't go take my first ski class and learn, you know, my first techniques and then go to my friends and be like, oh yeah, I can go ski with you. Let's go down the black diamond. You know, I wouldn't do that. I'd spend a lot of time by myself practicing before I went out and skied with my friends mm -hmm. who, you know, were good at skiing. Mm -hmm. So, so, so that's number one. That, that's the first thing is to actually really, really practice giving yourself empathy and compassion and getting clarity and then start practicing with other people in a intentional setting and then, um, and then start to kind of bring it into your, to, to your actual everyday life. And the way you need to do that is to really start giving yourself permission to not do or say anything. That's the first thing to practice with other people is when something happens and you start to feel emotions is to stop and to start to recognize your own emotions and don't do anything. Walk out the door, we'll go upstairs, just stand there and just do everything you can to just keep your mouth shut for a while. And so just, just to get, you need to start be giving yourself permission to have space. And when somebody says something to you that's just disarming, to start practicing saying, can I come back? Can I respond to you in five minutes? You know, I'm not sure what to say and I really want to respond to you. So can we do this in five minutes or 10 minutes and start practicing taking space? We all need to be a lot quieter and take a lot more time. The other thing when you talked about Jesus that really popped up to me was that this is a person who was not reactive. This is a person who actually took time and then was, you know, had full clarity before he acted or spoke. And that's something that we could all really use practice on. So, so I think that answers your first question. Is that? And that's <laughs> very much resonating with me. <laughs> yeah. Something that I've definitely not grown up with a concept of creating space for myself in that way. Yeah. And you know, when we do that, we give, we model and give other people that, sp that space. So if I ask you, you know, if you said something that kind of threw me off and I said, wow, Natalie, that sounds really important to you. And I really want to give you a thoughtful response. So I'd like to just take a few minutes to think about that. Then you're gonna, you know, you're gonna feel safe doing that with me too, mm -hmm. and we're gonna start teaching each other how to do that. So yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so your second question was, you know, what are the needs you, that that other people, the kids might be having? And um, yeah, definitely that whole kind of, well, it's my house and my space, and it's, and I'm the parent. So they just need to do what I say that that is a pretty common tactic and belief and I totally get it. And that's an easy way. Wouldn't it be nice if everybody always did what we said? <laughs> One of the things I like to think about with my kids is to think about the future and do I want them to be the type of person that just that does what, what somebody who, who um, thinks that they have power over them says without question. So their boss or their, um, or their partner, a partner that they're with, or even me as a parent, you know, there are parents who harm their children. And so do I want my child to grow up just doing what other people say? Because, because there is a power, because somebody has created a power imbalance. I would, like, I, I would like to live in a world where there are no power imbalances, where when power is used, it's used with people. Like I may have a skill that you don't have, but that doesn't mean that I have power over you. It means that together, that you can use that skill and I can make it available. Together we can, you know, um, I. I we can work together a combined power 
in order to um, achieve a, a result. So I don't want my kids to do something that their boss or their partner or a friend or anybody told them to do um, if it's not, if it's actually um, not authentic for them and if, it's, and if it goes against their core values. I want them to have that strength to actually uh, stand up for their core values. So I think that with our kids, if we really teach them this language of values, needs are really values, you know, valuing connection, valuing other, my own safety and other people's safety and other people's meaning and purpose and other people's and my own freedom of choice and valuing love. These are all actually values or needs. You could use either word. And so really having, using those values in conversation all the time so that kids learn the language of values. I, I really value a house where we all respect each other's space. And, and I really re value respect. And this is how we show respect for each other. So this is why I, I would like to have the shoes here and the, and the coats here because I value order. I value t efficiency. If, we, if the shoes are always there, we can be more efficient and we can support each other in living in a, in a, um, in a clean and, and a space where we can all fully express ourselves. So really using the language of values. So before you ever even walk into that messy room, the children, there's already this language that they understand and that they're speaking themselves about, about um, valuing each other about respect, mm -hmm. about personal space, about order and um, cleanliness, health, safety. These are all things that they're used to and that they're learning about. And so that's number one is that's you know, really important to have that already as part of the conversation. And so then when we look at a child who maybe is not picking up, doesn't want to pick up their toys, um, it's eight o'clock at night and they need to be in bed at eight, 830 and they don't want to pick up their toys or stop what they're doing. Really, before we move on, really acknowledging and, and, um, and sharing the value of whatever it is that they're trying to meet, whatever needs they're meeting. So, hey, you know, Susie, it's, it's you know, it's eight o'clock and, you know bedtime is is 8:30 and and that's because we both value your your sleep and your health and all these things we've already talked about and established and um you know no no I don't want to do it well I'm wondering Susie if um if you're feeling worried about finishing that art project, if it looks like it's really important to you. And I'm wondering if you're worried that if you stop now, you won't be able to finish it later. I'm wondering if you're worried about what will happen to it when it's gone, or I'm, I'm wondering, um, I can see that this really matters to you and that you're really expressing yourself and that that's really important to you to, to be able to finish something you started. Like we can all identify with that. We all want to finish things and we want to teach that to kids, right? To finish what they've started. So I'm wondering if you're just really wanting to finish what you started. And so kind of like guessing what's going on there or the child who won't put their coat on when we say put your coat on and, and kind of looking into like, I'm wondering if you want to choose for yourself. If, if you're, I'm worried about you being cold and, and I, I'm really wanting to support you being comfortable and healthy. I'm wondering when you say you don't want to put your coat on, what is it that you're wanting for yourself? Are you wanting to choose it for yourself? Are you, you know, just, just asking, asking them. And that autonomy is a very big need that we all have. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is really helpful. It sounds too to me that you're saying 
all these moments that could be huge blow up frustrating power struggle situations really are if you can make the space and collect yourself and be humble it's an opportunity to help each other grow to yeah. understand your needs better yeah. uh, to connect with each other and to work together better yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really important to recognize that we all have needs that we share and we have needs in every moment. And to also recognize and, and acknowledge that we don't always get to have our needs met. But often what's more important than getting our needs met is just having them acknowledged and and sharing them with another person. So like for Susie, who's wanting to finish her art project, but it's bedtime, you know, she truly has to just get up and go and go to, and go to bed. We can acknowledge what matters to her and really give her a chance to express what this means for her and what this is like for her and give her a chance to say, I'm feeling really sad and frustrated because you know, I, I really want to have this finished. And we can be there with her and say, yeah, I want that for you too. And I'm kind of feeling sad. I'm feeling sad that you don't get, to, that you're not going to finish that. And I'm, I'm wishing that it wasn't this late. And, and I understand that. And at the same time, we still need to go, we still need to get to bed because of these other things that we've already agreed on. It still needs to happen. And so I can, you know, hold Susie and we can cry together about that art project that didn't get finished and move on. And, you know, like when you, sometimes it's a safety issue with kids, like you have to go in your car seat and I can, while I'm putting the kid in the car seat, who's crying, you know, I can still be using the language of, I bet you're really angry right now because you don't want to be forced to do something. And I don't want it either. And I feel awful. I'm feeling sad because I'm forcing you to do something. And this, this is really hard. And just acknowledging that I want you to be able to choose for yourself. And I wish we didn't have to do this right now, but this is, I have to keep you safe. And, but we can do it without ignoring the needs that that person, that little child is having, which is so important. Yeah, absolutely. And how much better will our world be if we all practice <laughs> being more, you know, communicative in these ways? Um, and, and you mentioned restorative justice earlier. Um, we only have a little bit of time left together, but in the family setting, there are numerous times every single day where we probably need some kind of restorative justice, whether you flew off the handle and screamed at the kids and cussed at them, or um, you and your spouse got into it in front of the kids and you feel really awful, or I don't know, you know, one kid pushes the other one. Um, do, you, do you have any quick tips about having the conversations of restoring our relationships after things like that? Yeah, def definitely. So the first thing would be um, to remember that it's always important to ask permission when you want to have a conversation, to get the willingness to have a conversation first. And especially when it's around something that there's been a conflict, you want to make sure that the other person is willing and wanting to be present in the moment and have that conversation. So going up to somebody after the fact, whether it's a child or an adult, a, 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 your partner, and, and saying, hey, you know when that thing happened? I keep thinking about it and I'm feeling really blah, 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 you know, sad and worried, whatever it is. And I'd really like to actually talk about it. Would you be willing to to take some time and talk to me about it. And, um, and, and if the answer is no, then you may say, okay, well, is there, you're not willing now, but is there a time when you would be willing to do that? Because often we just walk into the room and say, hey, you know, and we start telling them, I felt awful about this thing and we start going off and they're in the middle of something and totally unprepared for the conversation. Or maybe they're still in a place of, repairing their own personal harm. They're just not ready to hear it. So when we 
ask them for permission, we immediately start that whole setting up of a safe space for repair. And so that so that's the, so that's the first thing. And then when the conversation is going to actually happen, just you really fundamentally sticking to the just that the four kind of components that we talked about. When this happened, I felt this because I was needing this. And um, you know, that that's the, those are kind of the most important things. I wish I had done this. Or what what would you be willing to tell me what it was like for you? Or would you be willing to tell me what you just heard me say? So, you know, when um when when I when I yelled at you, um, I was actually feeling really angry and, and now I'm feeling really worried about that and I'm really needing us to be connected and would you be willing to tell me what that was like for you? So, um, so, so that's one way, just using those four components either to express what was alive in ourselves in that moment, what's alive right now, why we're wanting to talk about it, and then to ask, inquire, what was alive for you when that happened and what, what, what's alive for you right now? And then ending it with what are we needing? What are you needing to, to repair? What, um, and are you willing to help me with what I'm needing to repair? So, so that's kind of the fundamentals. And um, just really quickly, I'll, I'll send you these questions. You and I talked about it. Another way to go about it is um, I've got a, a series of four questions that you can ask um, a person who has been harmed. So let's say you have two kids and they were fighting. So you actually have maybe both of them have been harmed and both of them have done the harm. But um, let's say just say one of them actually just did it. One kicked the other one. Okay. So you may want to gather the two kids and you get, per, you get willingness. Are you guys willing to have a conversation about this? And, um, and acknowledgement of what happened. You know, one had, the one has to admit that he kicked the other one. And then you can ask these questions. So for the, um, you always start with the victim when, you, when harm has been done. You always let the victim speak first. And it's really important the offender hears what the victim has to say. So we're going to ask the victim, what did you think when you realized what happened? So, you know, when, when you got kicked, what, what did you think when you realized that that person just did this to you? What impact did the incident have on you? We really give them a chance to talk about that impact. And maybe you might ask them, do you think it impacted anybody else? And what impact do you think it had? Um, what's been the hardest thing for you? Again, just really letting them talk about it. And then what do you think needs to happen to make it right? So they get to express what they're needing to make it right. And then the person who caused the harm, so the kid, maybe the, the sibling who did the kicking, they get to talk, what happened? They get to say what happened and there might be a little backstory that comes out with that. What were you thinking when that happened? So, you know, I don't know what I, uh, nothing, or I was thinking that I was mad and something needed to happen. Um, or I was thinking that, that I didn't want to lose my, the ball, you know, that, you, that maybe got taken away before, whatever it is. What have you thought about since? So they get to express any remorse or anger, anything that's happened. What have you been thinking about since? And then who has been affected by what you've done? So they get to really take some time and you can challenge them to think about all the people that were affected by what they did. And this is the thing that really uses shame, which is a super powerful and actually fabulous emotion for um, um, controlling behavior. Your children are way more likely to behave in a way you want them to if if you help them acknowledge and actually kind of connect with the shame that they feel when they cause harm, because we all feel shame when we cause harm, it's there. And so a lot, you know, kind of creating a safe space to connect with that and to admit, yeah, you know, I, 
yeah, I did this thing. I, I, I saw my sister crying and I kind of, I did actually feel bad about that. And, and I did get really scared that, that, that you know, mom was going to feel really sad too, and I see how it affected all these people, and I'm starting to, and I actually do feel bad about that. So they get to talk about all the people that they really realize were affected, and then what do you think you need to do to make things right? So they get to have a voice on um, what they think needs to be done. Ultimately, the victim and the offender so the two kids together need to come to an agreement and the victim it's all really about the victim really needs to be repaired be taken care of in in the repair so ultimately the victim has to be the one who says yeah that will take care of this for me but by having the conversation it just really diffuses everything and the victim actually becomes much more open to being healed. And, um, and so the healing can be much simpler than you might think once the conversation has happened. So does that help? Yes, that is amazing. And I'm so excited to include that resource for everyone who's watching yeah. um, with all those questions. And I know it is a lot to take in. This has been super, super meaty and very <laughs> inspiring and cutting to the heart. I'm so grateful to have had the chance to talk with you about this today, Lisbeth. Um, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, maybe to get some coaching with you, I can attest it's extremely valuable. Um, and if they maybe just want to explore nonviolent communication on their own, you know, how can they reach you? How, where should they go next? Um, well, they can go to my website, which is sacredconnections.space, and I will send you, um, I don't know if you post this with some resources, but I'll send you a list of resources. Okay. But um, the Center for Nonviolent Communication, it's, I believe it's cnvc.org, um, is a really great resource. And then there's also a website called NVC Training. Dot com I think it's dot com and um, that's another great resource that you can subscribe to that for a month by the month whatever and it has just hundreds of audio and videos to to download wow. and to listen to and um, yeah so those are two great resources they can Google or go on YouTube and Google nonviolent communication or, or search on YouTube nonviolent communication and there's a lot of videos um, made by Marshall Rosenberg there that they can watch for free and I'll send you the link to the um, the book uh, nonviolent communication by Marshall Rosenberg and I'll send you these questions and and yeah and and I would love to um, to any of your people listening are welcome to, to contact me. And I always just for free, I, I do, I work with people, just that initial conversations, just to learn about what it is they're looking for. So yeah, I'm happy to be a resource. Thank you so much. This yeah. All right. Bye everyone for today. Bye.